comes from a, a Nova powerhouse of mitochondrial research in, uh, at the University of Colorado. He has worked with uh, Genevieve. And uh, he's also going to talk about the uh, mouse model. Uh, thanks very much, Michael. Thanks to, uh, to the conference uh, organizers and Bar Syndrome Foundation for having me and allowing me to come and tell you a little bit about our progress on our studies with the TAS mice. Uh, still in progress, but uh, but been very exciting. And so this was the title that I submitted a couple of months ago, and I will actually comment on how we've been targeting content uh, and, and composition of cardiolipin with dietary linoleic acid and, and thyroxine. And I think it, it's, it's a perfect thing to follow uh, Michael's talk uh, because I think it parallels, if, at least if I caught all the data right, uh, a lot of what he was seeing, um, if you understand how these things may be connected. And then I'll also go on to talk a little about some other, also very much uh, in um, agreement with what's been discussed actually for the whole conference and specifically with what are some of the uh, uh, oxygen consumption substrate specificity uh, differences that we see in our TAS mice and then I'll end with some metabolomics that we just uh, completed. So if I can get this right. Okay. So first, the basis for our, our hypothesis that feeding linoleic acid would, would improve the cardiolipin profile, and that's, again, kind of the angle that we came from, is, uh, you know, initially, uh, Genevieve and I, uh, back in when I was a postdoc at CU, I described this progressive, whoops, progressive loss of the tetralinoleal cardiolipin in the hearts of these animals that are hypertensive and develop heart failure with age, the, the spontaneously hypertensive heart failure rat. And, uh, and we see it in both, you know, the subsarcolemma and IF mitochondria. You see it to some extent with aging and in other uh, models, but nowhere near to the extent that you see it with, uh, with pathologic aging, so to speak. And this correlated nicely with uh, uh, essentially a loss of, of cytochrome oxidase activity complex four. It's so kind of established the basis for this being an important thing, maybe in the absence of, of some part, something like Barr syndrome. So in, in just really kind of overload uh, hypertension, uh, heart failure. And so we, we fed these animals uh, a lot of high linoleic safflower oil, 20% by weight, um, uh, for uh, really months uh, to see if it would just improve survival. It's kind of our first study. And it did, uh, and it, it restored the tetralinoleal cardiolipin as far as the percent of total cardiolipin to, to the levels that you see in the normal healthy mice. And it correlated with, uh, with lifespan. And so that was pretty exciting. Uh, of course, this could be doing a lot more than just fixing cardiolipin, so to speak. Um, and so we, we decided to follow it up later, uh, not only looking at mitochondrial parameters and heart function and doing it for a shorter duration, but also um, a little bit less. So we, we fed 10% high linoleic safflower oil, which actually kept the total fat content to 20% of kcal, which is still a lot of linoleic acid, but not ridiculous, uh, you know, achievable, uh, so to speak, but still very high. And we saw, uh, we compared it with lard, which uh, is, you know, going to be having its own effects probably, but is, is not as rich in linoleic acid and would still give you the same amount of fat that you're adding to the diet. And we saw an improvement in total cardiolipin uh, and the tetralinoleal uh, percent, so to speak. And, uh, and also looked at mitochondrial, this is all this is pyruvate and palmitoyl carnitine, which are kind of our two standard substrates. And we saw an improvement. Um, with, in, with pyruvate and with uh, palmitoyl carnitine when we fed the linoleic acid. The lard had no effect with pyruvate, but trended up here with palmitoyl carnitine, but actually there's a lot of variability. Uh, so it seemed to be more of a, a specific effect on pyruvate. This is state three respiration, so uh, phosphorylating respiration. Uh, state four, um, we saw a trend for a little bit less um, with the uh, state four, which, which suggests maybe less leak, but that, that wasn't really significant. Uh, we did see higher uh, state four with palmitoyl carnitine when lard was fed or nothing, uh, but again this was all kind of you know trendy. But it, it fit our hypothesis and we were pretty excited. Uh, we did see an improvement in cytochrome oxidase activity with the linoleic acid, but not the lard. No real change here, um, although there are a few, and I'll, I'll hit those again uh, in the in the content of the enzyme, at least the, the subunits that we can blot for. Um, so suggesting that maybe the cardiolipin changes were playing a role. And then the, the LV function uh, was actually decreased in all groups because they are in heart failure. This is all 22-month or 21-month-old animals. And so they decline rapidly in that phase, but whereas they decline less with the uh, linoleic acid. And so that, that just came out, and even though we did it a few years ago, I finally finished it all up. And, uh, and so this was kind of the basis for trying it in, in the TAS mice. And so that was the question. Will feeding the, the TAS-deficient mice, and the ultimately Barr syndrome patients, improve or enrich cardiolipin with linoleic acid, and might that improve the cardiac re mitochondrial respiratory function? 
And so we got this mice from Zaza about a year, I guess about a year ago now, a little more. And we're aware that there was some, you know, lack of uh, cardiac dysfunction early on. But we, we, we did a lot of characterization early on, and we definitely see mitochondrial dysfunction. We definitely see the cardiolipin deficiency and the, and the compositional changes uh, very early on. And so we, we decided to focus on the mitochondria and the lipids first. If we can fix that, then maybe we try to go out longer and, and do the treatment and see if we can improve heart function if it's, if it's down. So that's what we started with, and the first thing we did, we fed 10% high little egg safflower oil in the diet. Uh, the mice were four to five months of age, uh, so a couple, at least a couple of months post weaning, uh, where we know we had mitochondrial dysfunction and, and loss of uh, total and tetralinyl ale cardiolipin. And the first thing we, well, we did a lot of things. This is the cardiolipin fraction isolated by LC and then done GC. So we just looked at the total fatty acid composition of cardiolipin. And uh, as I said, uh, certainly Michael and I, maybe perhaps others could sit around and, and look at all of the, this is just a small sample of what we have, of course, and really try to figure out what's going on. But, uh, but it was interesting, and this, this fit the hypothesis. This is linoleic acid here, and we see in the wild-type mice and the TAS-deficient mice, and incidentally, we do the same thing that Megan is, do, is doing with uh, inducing the TAS deficiency. It's 200 uh, mg per kg, so it's, it's lower. But we, uh, we definitely see, if you look at the white bar versus the dark, well, the third one, a, a, a decrease in the linoleic content, of course, of cardiolipin and it's increased statistically significantly in both, uh, maybe to a greater percent in the, uh, in the TAS. So that was successful. Uh, you see some of these 18-1, uh, both oleic and vaccinic, are down, so presumably being displaced by, uh, by linoleic. So that was, that was successful. If you look at PC and PE, again, I could go through all of them, and I, I really don't have time, but uh, ultimately it was interesting that there was an, sort of an accumulation of, of 18-2 in PC in the TAS-deficient mice in the absence of the diet change. So this, again, I think supports the idea that it's not being able to put in, be put into to, uh, cardiolipin from PC. Uh, this higher arachidonic in the TAS versus wild type in PE was also interesting, especially with uh, regard to what Michael was saying. Um, we, can, we can maybe talk about that in the discussion later. So if we do mass spec, and, I, and I've done the, Genevieve is, is still doing our mass spec, and we've done this. Uh, these are actually three pooled mice, uh, so we've got to do more. But uh, it, again, it kind of gelled with what we were expecting, uh, a little more uh, total cardiolipin, both in the wild type and in the TAS, although less, of course, in the TAS uh, total. Uh, the percent of total of, of linoleic uh, enriched cardiolipin was higher, uh, not anywhere near rescued, but, you know, increased. And again, when we do more, we'll see some variability, but um, you know, I think it's going to be tight, just like we are our LCGC. If we look at the uh, tet or trilinoleal monolysocardiolipin, it's actually elevated uh, in the TAS. And it's hard to know if that's just due to the fact that we have so much linoleic acid, and that's what's now occupying more of these sites, or if there's actually more monolysocardiolipin. So we'll have to look in more depth at, at, at what, what, what's, what the difference is there. But certainly these saturated, this is just one species at 1404 uh, mass to charge. So, you know, presumably one of the ones with 18 or 18.1 uh, is, is, uh, is lower. So what this is all saying is that the feeding of linoleic acid didn't restore a touch of linoleic cardiolipin and nowhere near absolute amounts, but was able to enrich it to some extent. So let's see what happens to mitochondrial function. Well, it didn't improve. Uh, in fact, it was a little worse uh, when we fed the linoleic acid. State 3 stimulated respiration, this is with pyruvate, malate. Uh, we've done it with palmitate a couple of times, and it's a similar uh, trend, either no effect or, or lower. Uh, and both of the wild type and the TAS, which was kind of surprising, because of course we saw an improvement when they had, when the rats that had heart failure. So this is subsarcolemma and IF mitochondria that we isolate, and then uh, we do this on the Ouroboros respirometer. And, um, give it ADP uh, and then pyruvate malate, or actually it's pyruvate malate, then ADP, and then let it run out so we can get state four respiration afterwards, kind of the classic. It's not, we could argue about whether it's uncoupled respiration, but the state four. And uh, it was lower in the wild type, maybe a little higher in the IFM. If you do a, a RCR, a respiratory control ratio, you can see it's actually lower in the TAS, uh, both when you feed linoleic acid. So this could be a reduce in quality, or it could be an increase in uncoupling. If you look at the amount of oxygen consumed in state three, it's a little bit higher uh, in both uh, the IF and the SSL, statistically significant in the SSM. So it's this idea that, if anything, this was not good, right? A little bit less coupled, uh, a little bit less capacity. And so, um, you yeah, know, not what we were hoping for. So the question then was, well, what if we could just stimulate biosynthesis of cardiolipin, increasing mitochondrial content, uh, would that do it, right? So our 
our, our pharmacological approach, which I think was somewhat comparable to Michael's approach to upregulate CL synthase, was to treat with thyroxine. And so this has been known for many years to increase mitochondrial cardiolipin synthase, uh, other remodeling or, or biosynthesis enzymes, uh, I believe maybe monolysocardiolipin as well, Grant. And so we know that this, this happens. It also in, in, in increases uh, mitochondrial enzyme activity, mitochondrial biogenesis, even suggested as a potential, although fairly uh, aggressive, treatment for heart failure. So let's see what happens. So this, uh, again, sort of what we expected. It increased total cardiolipin, not, did not even come close to restoring it in the TAS uh, mitochondria, but it, again, a blip, but, but probably significant. It decreased the amount of cardiolipin that was tetralin allele, which is, was not unexpected. Um, thyroxine can induce uh, desaturase enzymes. I'll talk a little bit about that in a couple of slides, but this can lead to conversion of linoleic into longer chain, like arachidonic acid. And, uh, you know, the production of the N3 long chains that can displace linoleic on cardiolipin, and so we think that's what it was, but, uh, but still more cardiolipin. The L3 was lower, uh, and clearly the monolysocardiolipin is higher in the TAS. Being lower here, again, I'm not sure if that reflects compositional changes in monolysocardiolipin or less of it. Um, it either one could, would make sense if we're, if we're driving a lot of biosynthesis, but um, which it is, we're not, we're not really sure. Uh, and we actually increased this saturated uh, cardiolipin as well. So kind of interesting. It did what the LA didn't do, right? I mean, it really increased the amount of cardiolipin without really improving its composition. So we'll see what happens. Um, oh, sorry. This is, uh, again, just for those of you that are interested in, in the actual, um, you know, composition of the, of the species, cardiolipin, PCPE. Uh, we saw an increase in, in the 18-1 vaccinic acid in particular, which I thought was kind of cool. Uh, and then uh, a slight decrease in 18.2. Some changes in PC, uh, 18.2 going up, but not in, the, um, in CL or PE, which I thought was interesting. And then DHA seemed to go up with thyroid treatment in the wild types and all the phospholipids with much less effect in, in TAS. So again, something Michael and I could probably sit down and look at and, or anybody else and try to figure out the implications of this, particularly uh, with regard to the uh, oxidized lipids that can be derived from these species and where they come from and what their, their function is. I mean, I, I'm fascinated by that too. But if we cut to the chase here, this is what happened with function. So state three respiration was stimulated in the wild types as expected, pretty substantially by thyroid hormone treatment, but no effect in the TAS. And you know, this is isolated mitochondria, okay? So we're looking at the intrinsic function of the organelle as opposed to looking at heart cells and seeing if there were more mitochondria. Uh, and, and we haven't actually we haven't done that yet. We're going to look just to see if you know, mitochondrial content is up. Uh, but the, the organelles themselves, which is kind of what we were focusing on, right, cardiolipin and its function, didn't, this, this didn't help to have a little bit more cardiolipin. Uh, uncoupled was a little bit higher in both TAS and wild type, at least in the subsarcolemal. Um, if we look at the control ratio, again, the TAS seemed to be being doing poorer, uh, less coupled or more damaged and more oxygen consumed in the IF, uh, the TAS that were treated. So again, if anything, this is, this is you know, harmful, presumably. We don't know. Now, if we have a lot of ROS production, a little bit of uncoupling could be protective. If, uh, you know, so so you, could, you could argue, especially data like this, in a lot of ways. But it certainly didn't augment mitochondrial function like we hoped it would, as it did the cardiolipin. So uh, some echo data here, I just threw this in. We're actually doing, and if some of you may have been thinking, well, okay, you got more cardiolipin here, you got more tetralinyl percent with LA, what about combining them? And so we're doing that. We've done the echoes, we're gonna take them down next week, actually, um, and it's not looking good. We've already lost four, and none of them, well, we lost one thyroid-treated uh, animal in the past, but, but four out of eight died. We had to add another cohort when we combined them. So I'm, I'm not optimistic this is gonna be better. But if you look at the end diastolic area, really there's no effect of linoleic feeding on the normal mice. You put the linoleic or, or thyroid hormone, you put the thyroid hormone in, and it actually causes the hearts to dilate a little. Right? So this is, from remember from the talks today, probably not a good thing. Uh, TAS, feeding uh, the TAS mice LA, may, not really any effect, but maybe a trend towards dilation. The thyroid definitely dilated the hearts very tight. Every one of those was bigger than all of these. And then uh, it's about the same when you throw the linoleic acid on top. Fractional shortening, you know, a little variability here, maybe a little stimulated by thyroid hormone in the wild type um, with no real additional effect of LA. 
LA not helping things, if anything, down. This is at a P value of like 0.07, so it's, it's not helpful. Um, this is statistically significant and lower, so we're, we're basically driving them into the ground, I think, with thyroid hormone. And this is not a, a new idea. If you have a dysfunctional heart, dysfunctional mitochondria, you upregulate them, you put more demand on the organ, uh, it, it may fail. And that's, you know, that's kind of the complicated thing with some, some, some of these uh, types of treatment. Um, so, in summary, uh, high uh, like safflower oil supplementation, it can partially restore tetralinolenic cardiolipin or, C or CL18-2 content, but doesn't, that doesn't result in any improvement in mitochondrial function. You can get cardiolipin levels up with thyroid hormone, but this didn't uh, seem to help either, much like we've seen when the CLS transgenic was crossed with the uh, TASMICE, right? I think so. And so even though this, this had expected stimulatory effects in the wild-type mice. So, so increasing what the TAS mice are doing, much like Dr. Kelly, I guess, has hypothesized, and this is not a new idea, but if you have dysfunctional mitochondria due to genetic problems, and you, you tell them to proliferate and make more, you have more dysfunctional mitochondria, maybe, and, uh, or maybe even worse, depending on exactly what, what you're, you're trying to augment. Together, uh, you know, we'll see what it does to mitochondrial respiration, but it's, it's not going to be a viable treatment based on our results with the echo and, and, and mortality. So the question that comes to my mind is, what if we could restore tetralinyl cardiolipin without slamming them with a giant amount of you know, linoleic acid uh, oil uh, or thyroid hormone? Like, what if we could actually figure this out right, and try to, try to get it back, whether it's gene therapy or something else? And so I couldn't do that. But we have been trying to do this in other models uh, for a while. And so I wanted to give you a quick uh, segue to this, this, this other stuff that I've done with um, other models of dis heart dysfunction that are associated with cardiolipin abnormalities. And so in, in cardiac overload, like aortic banding or these heart failure rats that we've studied, even in old mice and rats, some depending on the strain, you basically see a decrease from the tetralinolale into, chain, into a species that have actually long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, so it's much different from Barr syndrome. But, uh, but you see a, lo a loss of tetralinolale cardiolipin and an accumulation of long chains in there. And so this is a, a, one of Jen's mass specs from a paper uh, she published in 05, and we see this uh, routinely. If you look at them more closely, um, and I've done this, you know, for years now, and if you just look at the total myocardial fatty acid uh, pool, the, the content of linoleic goes down as the animals get worse in terms of heart failure. Arachidonic trends up, or maybe no change, but DHA definitely goes up. And so the fact that there's this global change in the fatty acid composition of the, of the, my, of the myocardial phospholipids uh, got me thinking, well, yeah, maybe they're rearranged, and maybe there's some interesting remodeling, but there's also a change in the total amount of these things relative to everything else. And so maybe it's a metabolism of, of polyunsaturated fatty acids. And so this is a, kind of a busy slide, trying to summarize this pathway in, in a small space. But basically, you know, you eat your, your um, linoleic and your alpha-linolenic essential fatty acids. They're converted by delta-60 saturase and the elongase enzymes that then kind of down a pathway of more elongase and desaturase enzymes, ultimately to produce DHA from your omega-3 and arachidonic and eicosanoids from from your, uh, your little leg. And believe it or not, that's actually pretty simplified, obviously, especially at this end. But if we had our hypothesis that if this is stimulated in these disease states, then you'd expect to see less linoleic, more product, and, and which, which includes eicosanoids. That's, of course, exactly what we see. So if we inhibit this, we would presumably see an increase in linoleic acid, decreased long chains, decreased eicosanoids, and maybe that would be a good thing. So we, we've, you know, this is what a lot of my funding has been to do. We did it, and it worked beautifully. We restore linoleic acid levels, both in, well, normal mice had no problems, nothing to fix. Aortic banding and in heart failure, we see kind of a, you know, progressive, to, so to speak, then to two, two different models, but a less loss of linoleic, it's restored. Arachidonic's up, that's down. DHA is up, it's normal. Touch of linoleal cardiolipin's down, and it's normalized. Cardiolipin that has a lot of these long chains that we kind of just pool a few species up there in 1498 and above, um, you know, back down basically all the way with no real changes in total cardiolipin. So it was great to actually see that we could, at least in this model, right, fix it. This won't work in Barr syndrome, I don't think, because they don't have an accumulation of long chains. That doesn't seem to be the issue. But it was a great kind of proof of concept that at least, you know, okay, we can, in this model, we can sort of fix cardiolipin's composition, see what happens without loading them up with fat. Unfortunately, so not be, despite seeing a significant loss in tetralinyl cardiolipin in the, in the animals that were aortic banded, there was really, if anything, an increase in state three respiration. This is probably rebate again. Uh, it was lower in heart failure, but absolutely no effect of normalizing tetralinyl cardiolipin with that drug. 
Um, state four respiration, you know, is a real variable with no real changes, although this was statistically significant. Uh, we were able to decrease it, and the RCR is a little higher for that reason. And so there's some suggestion that, that the efficiency of respiration may be improved by normalizing tetralinyl cardiolipin or decreasing long chains at least. Um, but when we did some more careful blotting of the respiratory chain complexes in these models, uh, we see pr pretty significant decreases in the content of complex one and two, which, uh, um, you know, in the heart failure. Again, no effect of, of normalizing cardiolipin, but you have uh, that possibly explaining the decreased in uh, resp state three respiration and some increases that may explain this trend here. But it, it, to, to me, this meant a pretty good disconnect between cardiolipin composition and mitochondrial function. Um, a lot of interesting things happened in the animals. They actually did better. Uh, so maybe it's something else. But as far as respiratory function goes, it was a pretty big disconnect. So we did this in, I won't go through this whole slide, but we did this in old mice and saw the same thing. Um, we, we see a decrease in the tetralinyl or the percent of linoleic acid in cardiolipin with aging in, in the C57 blacks, both populations. That's not really associated with any dysfunction. We can fix it by inhibiting desaturase, and that doesn't seem to improve function uh, in either SSLs or IFs. So again, kind of supporting the, the disconnect. So conclusions here, um, enriching cardiolipin with uh, linoleic acid, I, you know, and maybe it's too bold at this point, but it doesn't, to me, seem to be a, a, at least a major regulator of mitochondrial respiratory function or dysfunction uh, in, in at least these models, okay? And uh, the lack of benefit of, of, uh, of the thyroid hormone and, and perhaps even pulling in uh, Michael's data that you can upregulate cardiolipin synthesis genetically, uh, this doesn't seem to rescue the TAS-deficient mitochondrial re uh, phenotype either. And so maybe it's not about you know, co content or, co or, or, um, or composition, or maybe we have to put them together in some safe way. I don't know. Uh, so perhaps, you know, to suggest, perhaps the pathologic def effects of TAS deficiency extend beyond the cardiolipin content and composition, which was kind of brought up and, and discussed kind of throughout. So we still had this nagging question that I really wanted to know, and we, it, this is all nice to present this way, but it, we've been doing all this kind of at the same time. But how exactly does TAS deficiency impair mitochondrial respiratory function? There's a lot of things that mitochondria do, but can we define at least what's going on in respiratory function? And so I'm going to zip through this pretty quick because it's just almost exactly what, uh, what Michael showed. So when we, when we do the uh, isolated mitochondria on the Ouroboros, and we've done this very carefully many times, uh, we see a pretty consistent 50% loss of of, of respiratory capacities, the state three respiration, with pyruvate and malleated substrates. Similar, if not worse, um, with uh, at least in the SSLs, worse, but about the same, you know, averaging out to about a 50% reduction when we do fat palmatil carnitine. We haven't done uh, octaneal uh, carnitine, but that's a great idea. We'll do that next. Uh, glutamate, we see a pretty nice percent increase, 69% increase here, uh, and 46% increase. Not, not increase. It's greater in the TAS than the wild type. Not only that, but the person I have doing this is, is very good, very thorough. We get a lot of consistency day to day. And if you actually look, the absolute rates of, of, of state three respiration that we're getting with glutamate are no different or even higher uh, from what we're getting with pyruvate or palmatil carnitine in the wild type. So this is showing that if you give the TAS mitochondria glutamate, they can achieve the oxphos rates that the wild types can. Right? So it's a substrate-specific problem. So very much what we're seeing. And actually, if you think about it, it gels with a lot of what we've been saying at the entire conference, right? That it's fat and carbohydrate. Uh, where is the problem? I don't know. So we did a little you know, uh, more at this. So we, if you throw succinate in, which can go right to complex two, it's not really down. I mean, it's down. So you know, cardiolipin may affect the respiratory chain, uh, at least the compositional change or the content, who knows, but it's not anywhere near the extent that you see total respiratory capacity down. Cytochrome oxidase, uh, we picked, because it's, you know, the, I don't know, most evidence for cardiolipin composition dependence, and it's down, but, you know, last I heard, and who knows if this has ever been worked out, but this thing's probably running several fold higher than it needs to in, in, in isolation like this to, to, to support respiration. So I, I, I can't say that that's going to be a major contributor to, the, to what we're seeing, but it could, you know, who knows. Uh, we've done the oxphos blotting, um, and this isn't particularly clear, and I couldn't get the densitometry quick enough, but essentially we've got uh, a slight decrease in complex 2 and 5, that's what we saw, um, at about the extent that we're seeing this, actually, about a 20% or 15% decrease in complex 2. Uh, 5, I think, it was a little less, and it's just trendy. And, um, so you know, perhaps there is, there's, a, there's a component, but I'm going to say, based on this data, that the respiratory chain seems to be able to handle it as long as you can give it glutamate. 
at, you know, at least to the extent that the wild types are. So TAS deficiency must impair mitochondrial membrane transport of pyruvate and fatty acids or otherwise limit their oxidation by TCA cycle enzymes. And so, you know, I, I, this has been alluded to a lot. I, I might have the busiest <laughs> slide trying to explain TCA that, so far. Or no, I think somebody showed, uh, was it Miriam that showed all the amino acids coming in? So I'm going to try to, uh, I'm going to cut a little of that out. <laughs> but just to review here, uh, you know, pyruvate comes in through a pyruvate transporter. Uh, you can generate acetyl-CoA using CoA by pyruvate dehydrogenase, get an NADH, and it enters the cycle that way. Uh, if you put malate in, of course, you add, uh, you can have oxaloacetate and you can run the cycle, and that generates NADH and then FADH for your, for your respiratory chain. So that's dysfunctional with TAS. Okay, you put palmitoyl carnitine in, it's transported by a couple of CP2, CP, uh, you know, carnitine palmitoyl transferase enzymes, a CoA uh, is added in, in the um, mitochondria, forming your fatty acyl CoA, and then you beta oxidize, you get acyl CoA, so basically the same thing. Comes into the same place, as long as you have malate, you can run this. Um, succinate can come in through a succinate transporter, go right to complex two, and so you're looking basically at this effect. If you put rotenone in, you can, which we did, you can look at just these and they seem to be okay. Glutamate, a little more complicated, and especially to add to the slide, but if it, com it comes in through a you know, glutamate aspartate antiport, uh, so aspartate goes out, glutamate comes in, can be converted into aspartate-glutarate, uh, asp uh, aspartate in, in a, not in the isolated mitochondria, but in the cell can be converted to oxaloacetate, back into malate, which can exchange, come in uh, as alpha ketoglutarate comes out. Cool thing is, is, what this means is if you put glutamate in, you can get NADH without coming in here. Right? And so Dr. Kelly's hypothesis, and I missed this talk, but we've talked, so I think this is it. If you've got a block at isocitrate dehydrogenase, uh, glutamate would work, I think. Right? So if I remember my, my chemistry right. Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting is this CoA idea. Right? And so CoA is required to form this, to form this. It's actually required to form this. But if, if you can't even do this step, you could still get glutamate in. Alpha ketoglutarate would come out, exchange with malate, uh, which would give you uh, malate here. By getting glutamate in, aspartate would come out, which would be generated from oxaloacetate. So you could run MDH and get NADH here as well, if, if, I'm, if I'm thinking of that right. So, and, and I think the system, you, you'd have an accumulation of aspartic acid, um, but you could, you could get some NADH. And I think one thing that's interesting to note is that you know, the wild-type heart mitochondria didn't seem to do too well on glutamate. Right? So the, presumably there's been an upregulation of this in the TAS, a compensatory upregulation. Um, to, to, to get as much as possible, whether it's an A and T interaction or, or the transporter content, which we're, we're probably blotting for today, I hope, because it's been on the list for a while. So, very interesting. Uh, we did metabolomics. I, I may be over, but it's last, almost last slide. Uh, just very recently, and I was very careful about this. You know, this stuff kind of worries me, especially metabolomics in the heart, right? So we, we got it very, uh, the animals as, as lightly anesthetized as Iacuc would let us. We open up the chest and we freeze clamp the beating heart. Right? And in doing that, you squeeze the, as much blood out as you, you can reasonably, and, and you immediately get it cold. And we did a, a global metabolic profile, I think 7,500 uh, peaks. Uh, you, know, you get a lot. It was last week. Uh, we only annotated the differences that were statistically significant, and this is uh, nearly all of them. Uh, and the most you know, glo you know, uh, striking thing that you see initially is a whole bunch of amino acids are higher in the heart. If you look a little further, um, most of them enter the TCA as acetyl-CoA or pyruvate. A um, couple are ketogenic and gluconeogenic. Aspartate, of course, as I mentioned, is involved in exchange with glutamate to get in, and that's higher. Um, uh, val uh, valine is going to be converted into uh, succinyl-CoA. I'm not sure what that means, if it'd be higher. I'm not sure what a lot of this could mean. It could mean a lot of things, I guess. But this is, this is what we've seen. Only three things were down, proline, taurine, and pantothenic acid. And so when, when you see all the p-values and the differences, and there's only three things that are down, and you know, what, what does that mean, right? So proline and taurine can both be used to, to the producer, in, in this case, um, generate, um, or, or be, uh, glutamate can become proline and vice versa. Taurine can generate glutamate. Uh, arginine can also generate glutamate. 
And so that wasn't different, but arginine you know, feeding presumably could possibly maintain glutamate, and that could be part of this, this protective effect it's seen. Uh, but pantothenic acid was the, 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 the largest decrease, and it, does, it kind of pales in comparison to the increases, but we're looking at about a, 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 nearly a 50% decrease, extremely tight, highly significant in pantothenic acid. I have no idea what this is. So inosine is purine metabolism. Phenytoin is like an anti-seizure drug, uh, and, and I'm, I'm thinking that's a mishit in terms of ID. But it's the highest increase that we have. So we're all about finding out that it is. You know, that's going to be a project. But uh, yeah, so I had to throw that in there, but I really don't know what that means. But if we just draw a line here, at least, and try to understand, you know, what is all this meaning, uh, at least the pantothenic acid, this got me very excited. And again, it's only been a couple of days, so maybe I just half-baked ideas. But pantothenic acid is used for the synthesis of CoA. And as I mentioned here, CoA is required for all of the steps that would get you uh, fatty acid and pyruvate oxidation, even complete oxidation through here. But if you didn't have enough of that, uh, you could still, at the very least, get some N NADH um, through, through this with uh, glutamate and malate. And we think that that's enough to run things on in the TAS mitochondria. So is it a CoA thing? Well, this is not a new idea. In fact, you know, uh, well, first let me just show you. There are some several interesting, notable effects of, of pathogenic acid, which is vitamin B5, CoA deficiency, and uh, you know, obviously this 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 is a well-established notion that you're not going to oxidize carb or fat well. Car taurine excretion, which of course was, taurine was lower in the hearts, is increased when you have uh, a B5 deficiency, growth failure, adrenal insufficiency, inc impaired cholesterol biosynthesis, and hypocholesterolemia. Uh, you know, presumably through this pathway, so, you know, potentially this would be, you know, higher. So CoA is, you know, and this is not a new idea, and I think some people who study mitochondrial diseases, you know, I may be missing a lot here, but uh, this was suggested back in 94, before they even knew about tafazin in, in a case of Barr syndrome, and it was actually shown to be um, successful uh, with one patient. It was followed up in, in 2003, and then uh, subsequently shown not to really be successful. So... You know, is this, uh, is this a problem with potentially uptake, a utilization? Um, I know that Dr. Kelly has used, or, or patients have been being fed pantothenic acid um, for you know, years, and, and we don't, we're not, we're not, I don't think we're missing anything that we, um, you know, with, with feeding a pantothenic acid in terms of a, of a benefit. But if there's some problem with uptake or utilization uh, into the cells, into the, into the blood, who knows, uh, that could really be an interesting new idea uh, to pursue, and it's, it's a water-soluble vitamin. So our plans are to uh, do metabolomics on other tissues and serum and then see how, how widespread this is, look at CoA levels, and, uh, and, and just follow this up a little bit more. So with that, I'll end. Uh, my, my lab is great. Obviously, didn't do any of this myself. Uh, Catherine does all my mitochondria stuff, uh, and Chris does all my lipids. Um, my collaborators, of course, I couldn't have done any of this without Zaza getting me a jump start with, on, on the world by s sending me some mice and then have to wait for them from Jack. Genevieve does all my math spec, and Sylvia has given me uh, this SHHF rats for those studies. And, of course, a big thanks to Bar Syndrome. Uh, I wouldn't have done any of this without, without them. And then AHA and NAH for, uh, for the rest of the funding. Thanks. Um, thank you, Adam, for an interesting and thought-provoking uh, presentation. We don't have time for questions, but we will allow it to anyway. Uh. So, 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 Adam, I'm just wondering about your concentrations of thyroxin for the induction. Oh, yeah. Are, are those pathophysiological? Because it yeah. looks, so based we've on done, the, you know, the heart rate, body weight ratios, it looks like it's pathophysiologic. Have you tried titrating? We have. So we've done 0.05% and 0.1%. Both will result in, in hyperthyroidism, um, although much less so with the 0.05%. Uh, I showed you the point one. They're very similar. Uh, there was a, a somewhat of a dose response in terms of the cardiolipin, but they both, like on heart function and mitochondrial function, they had the same effect. So we could go lower, but the fact that, that cardiolipin biosynthesis was, was not even that well in, increased with the high dose, uh, unless there's sort of a, kind of a, a feedback to destroy them because it's so pathologic. I mean, we could go even lower, but uh, you know, I just don't think that's going to do it. I mean, it's doing it enough to study it, but I don't think it's going to restore it in, in Barth kids. Uh, beautiful work. I uh, really enjoyed it. So your, your model is very interesting. Um, when you um, knock out the D6D, you um, increase the tetralinolic uh, acid content in cardiolipin and decrease the, um, the uh, DHA content. Did you measure the oxidative stress level? I mean, there is, there is an ongoing debate in other fields about so-called mitochondrial dysfunction. What does that mean? Mm. Um, at, at least in diabetes, obesity research field, people have the 
you know, the, the data is all over the place. You, higher mitochondrial activity, lower or you no know, change, they could all do the, t the harm. But uh, right now, people believe that oxidative stress is the buzzword that probably doing all the harm. Yeah, th great. Thanks for the question. Great question. So, so it's in a nutshell, the, uh, the, so if you, it depends how you measure oxidative stress, right? So if you look at ROS production, and it depends on the model, and we can talk after this because we've done this in OB mice too and seen similar effects, although mitochondrial effects are more interesting. Uh, we, so in the SHHF rats, uh, ROS release from mitochondria was actually increased slightly, but it was very variable and as these animals are. What was consistent, and is consistent in every single model we've done every time, is that the levels of malondialdehyde, so lipid peroxidation product, go down. And levels of HNE, which is lipid peroxidation product from the N6s, they go down. And they correlate very nicely with the membrane composition. Even in animals where you know, there isn't a huge amount of, of oxidative stress, it'll, it'll go lower. They always correlate well. well. So at least lipid peroxidation uh, is going to be lower because the double bond content is lower. And then the implications that that may have on the function of enzymes that are uh, regulated by things like cardiolipin or phospholipids that have polyunsaturated fatty acids is very interesting because, it's, as you know, car oxidized cardiolipin could lead to things like cytochrome C release, uh, potentially, you know, super complex instability, increasing ROS production. So I think it is very complicated. It depends on the model. It depends on how much DHA, for instance, they have normally. But uh, basically, you bring down PUFAs, the highly unsaturated PUFAs, and you bring down lipid peroxidation every time. Yeah. Yes, but I mean, um, oxidative stress is a dangerous generalization, as we, as we have seen uh, uh, you know, many times. For instance, uh, we all think that oxidative stress is increased in Wolf syndrome, yet Michael Kiewicz has shown that the concentration of oxidized fatty acids is actually decreased. So we have to be more specific and should sort of move away from these buzzwords that, that sound good, but actually don't make a lot of sense. Mm, good point. Um, with these words, um, you want was the very last comment. Very last. Very last before lunch. <laughs> um, could, could, could you go back to the mitochondrial transport slide? Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Spent much time on this. Okay. this one, yeah. And point to the GA. So one of the things that's interesting in the patients is Exchange for glutamate, and as I said before, I, I, I'm, I assume that glutamate consumption is increased in bar syndrome, but I haven't treated it in that way. The other thing about the coenzyme A, uh, we can't explain that one case. It's in, and certainly there could be many other. As I'm sure there are many other mitochondrial deficiencies in the syndrome, and that could be it. One other factor, though, is if fatty acid beta oxidation is down then maybe uh, there's down regulation of the need for pantothenate. So that'd be one possibility. And then the other thing is um, there's conflicting data on the reactive oxygen species. Uh, but even if there were an increase in reactive oxygen species, the primary target of, uh, of ROS is tetralinoleocardiolipin, which is also down. So maybe that's why we can't get uh, antioxidant cocktails to work. I think that's a great point. Uh, you know, too much like I said, you know, the, we see at least this with lipid peroxidation being, you know, the target, the, the membrane uh, lower whenever you have PUFAs that are lower. And so, and we've measured ROS release. I think I mentioned this as, as one of the comments. Uh, ROS release is lower in the TAS mitochondria than the wild type. So. But, yeah. Okay, so we will, we will uh, thank you very much. We will skip the uh, brainstorming session.